and Adrian Doss, who's in this meeting, I think, um, is working on uh, drought tree mortality prediction. And um, the Battles Lab is helping us with some sugar pine vulnerability and evaluation. Woo, okay, that was it. Great, thanks, Christy, right on time. All right, Crystal, you're up. Do you wanna share your, can you stop sharing your screen, Christy? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Many of you know I've just returned to California in the last year and just really appreciate an opportunity to engage with uh, long ongoing research here. Uh, my goal today is uh, to convince you that we need to stop asking the question uh, of whether these fire seasons are disasters and start asking the question of uh, where are the opportunities and where are the beneficial components uh, alongside some of the disastrous outcomes in these fires um, and really start thinking about these impacts as heterogeneous even within a fire. Um, ecologists know this, we, we often, landscape ecologists particularly focus on heterogeneity, but we often forget about it when we're trying to very simply characterize fires. And I argue that it's actually a detriment to our ability to manage these systems go going forward and to convey this to the public. Um, because one of the chief problems we have is that uh, wildfire science has historically focused on size. We have an obsession with size uh, in many <laughs> aspects of, uh, <laughs> of humanity, but we particularly do within fire. Um, and so we see things like, oh, this 40 year increase in area burned across the Western US. Of course, when you actually look at the much longer term uh, trends in area burned across the Western US. What we see is that in the first half of the 20th century, there was a substantially greater area burned uh, across the Western US. And, and the recent decades is really an uptick uh, after the wetter, cooler period in mid 20th century. Um, and you know the problem with that obsession with size and really trying to diminish the size of wildfires is that as we all know, uh, these biomes are fire evolved. Uh, with various types of fire frequencies and intensities. Um, but in California, of course, much like uh, most of the, uh, the forests in North America, uh, these forests need fire in, in some shape, form, and frequency. Um, and the challenge is the changes that we're seeing in those fires on this landscape. So what I've started to ask for the last couple of years is, well, okay, size is an easy metric for us to measure, but what are the other types of metrics uh, we can use? Um, and a lot of times when I talk about this, uh, I'm focused on some of the human components. Um, obviously this is a tree mortality workshop. Um, so a lot of these ecosystem components um, are relevant to tree mortality because they're some of the ecosystem services from these forests, right? And what we really wanna know is when are dead trees or injured trees a negative and when are dead or injured trees actually a positive um, because they're not always a negative. Um, and I want to focus on uh, three key fires in 2020 um, which all have received a tremendous amount of media attention um, and the August complex, the Bear Fire which is part of the North complex uh, predominantly in the Plumas National Forest uh, and then the Creek Fire uh, in the Sierra National Forest and um, Christy gave a, just a really lovely overview of the SQF, the Castle Fire specifically in the SQF complex. I'm not going to focus on that too much but uh, you know as, as Christy just noted um, all of these areas occurred in forests that had not seen fire in in over a century in many cases, right? Um, these historically had uh, relatively high frequency fire, uh, moderate fire return intervals. Um, and some folks up in Missoula have started, um, you know, utilizing this new metric, this anomalous fire potential as essentially a ratio of the burn probability um, and if you invert the burn probability, that gets your current uh, fire, your contemporary fire return interval. And if we ratio the historic fire re return interval to the contemporary fire uh, return interval and rescale that, we get this really nice map of you know where in California we have this departure 
combined with an incredibly high burn probability uh, that is going to potentially result in um, intense and um, outside of the range of historic regimes for fire. So I'm going to start with the Creek Fire uh, because this is pretty close to home for me. I actually live in North Fresno right now. Um, so this is uh, a fire that we watched and felt the smoke from for uh, quite a few weeks this summer. Uh, and of course, where the media attention was focused was on the large size. This was a, this was a 380,000 acre fire, uh, you know, nearly a thousand structures destroyed. Um, a lot of those were out buildings, so about a third of that was actually primary homes. Um, high suppression costs, luckily they had zero fatalities, um, and this fire produced a lot of unhealthy air quality uh, in Fresno and the Central Valley, right? Um, and really this was a major concern for ecologists uh, because this is the part of the Southern Sierra again where we've got this potential for permanent conifer forest loss potentially uh, uh, primarily at those those mid elevations where the drought hit hardest um, from 2012 to 2017. Um, and when I look at this fire, um, you know, part of what I'm really focused on is, is not the red parts of the map. Uh, as a geographer, I think a lot about cartography and red is, of course, this color that we associate with danger, with bad, uh, whatever it may be. Um, but what I have instead focused on is the green parts of the fire or even the orange parts of the fire. And this is a ravage map from the Forest Service. Um, so in the Creek Fire uh, perimeter, right, we had about 40% of the fire that was either in closed canopy, so late succession, or open canopy, so mid to late succession conifer, um, that you know was greater than 50% basal area loss. Um, and those are the areas that, you know, are the, the ones that show up in the pictures as uh, as the, the sort of nuked landscape, right? Um, but over a huge proportion of this fire, we didn't have that, right? Uh, we had large areas of the fire uh, that had less than 50% basal area loss. Um, you know, in late stage closed canopy forests, um, that lower basal area loss is actually doing the work that wildfires have always done, which is actually thinning that out, right, uh, and reducing those understory fuels. Even in, in open canopy, it's, it's very much the same thing. We're just thinning out a lot of those uh, dead trees and, and fuels. And of course, you know, this is not ground truth. <laughs> um, this is just a preliminary map from, from satellite imagery. Um, but what I want to focus on here is, is not that you know, a huge proportion of this fire burned at high severity, but instead that fire did the job that fire has always done in cleaning out and reducing fuels and dead trees um, and understory growth from very large areas of this fire. And that in the higher elevations, uh, you know, particularly in the wilderness areas, there were a lot of really good fire effects. And you know when we look at the soil burn severity map, um, it's very similar to the the ravage map, slightly different coloring. Uh, but what we essentially see is that you know about half of this fire burned at either unburned or uh, low severity, um, and that's a pretty substantial proportion, right? That's over half of the fire that actually probably had um, within range fire effects. Um, the other key things that I looked at with this fire were that we had some really positive success stories that came out of it. So Southern California Edison um, and the Forest Service uh, have done a lot of management work and prescribed fire right around Shaver Lake uh, that was really uh, what saved Shaver Lake in many respects um, during the fire, both the town and the hydropower capacity of the lake, right? 96% um, of this fire was outside of the Wui, so I, I know for, for folks interested in the trees, um, that may not make you feel much better, um, but it's really critical for sort of the disaster component of this, you know, and a huge proportion of this fire, are, it was on a landscape that needed fire. It was essentially a first fire after a century of suppression. Um, so what I ask is, well, how can man Management capitalize on this and is there potential to increase prescribed fire over huge parts of this fire that we previously considered too dangerous there was too much fuel uh, we would have gotten really poor fire effects can we look at some of the areas within this fire now and say okay that was our first fire can we actually start to reintroduce prescribed fire in some of these areas 
areas now because the wildfire, uh, however unintentional and not necessarily what was desirable, it did some of that first entry work for us. And, you know, of course, there's disastrous outcomes with this fire, right? Um, this is from a dispersed area south of uh, Shaver Lake, where there was quite a few homes lost, um, you know, but even within, this is literally across the street from that burned down house, about three weeks after this area burned, uh, we have oaks coming back, right? Because they're so adapted and even without rain, they're also they're able to draw on those root reserves and start regenerating. Um, and then of course, in the area where there had actually been some of that um, post drought conifer reduction uh, in the Southern part of the fire, um, there were great fire effects, uh, predominantly surficial, uh, killing some of the canopy uh, trees and then leaving the overstory uh, relatively uninjured. Um, the August complex, of course, made major headlines. Uh, it was described in the news media as the first gigafire uh, in US history, which is um, incorrect on two levels. One, a gigafire is not a million acre fire. And, uh, two, uh, there have been several large events in Alaska that were much bigger than this. But um, for the lower 48, right, this, this is a, a relatively large fire in the contemporary period. Um, and again, when we look at the ravage data, what we see is that yes, there are some areas of this fire where we had high basal area loss um, in closed canopy, late stage coniferous forest, right? Um, or even mid late stage uh, open canopy coniferous forest, right? So about 25% of this fire um, ends up being sort of that most severe level of forest loss. But again, uh, much more than that, is actually fire within the range of historic variability, right? Where we've got some, some basal area loss, it's more of that low, moderate severity type of fire that was consistent historically in this landscape before a hundred years of suppression, um, you know, and a significant portion of this fire on the Mendocino is, is actually in, in shrubland and non-vegetation. Um, you know, this portion in the Southeast section, a, a lot of this is sort of in that lower elevation uh, grassland and, and oak woodland savanna. And, um, so, so it's, when we look at these maps without the context of what vegetation was burning, it's easy to sort of cringe and say, oh gosh, that's a lot of red. Um, but when we actually have the context of thinking about, all right, there was no fire here for a century, um, and we've got a significant amount of fuel uh, that was um, in an over dense forest and consumed by this fire. It opens up opportunities, and you know, really, this fire, um, yeah, it was big, but it was a low impact fire in terms of the human impacts. Um, only 3.3% of the uh, fire was actually impacting Louis areas. And most of the structures that were lost uh, were there at the very Northern part of the fire where, uh, where the town is that um, was impacted by this, right? And yes, there was one fatality um, and that, that was a firefighter from out of state, right? But over a huge portion of this fire, again, we have this area that, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, in a hundred year Cal Fire history, there had been no fire. Um, and so this is uh, about 82% of this was first fire um, after over a century of suppression. Um, you know, and one of the things that I've asked is, okay, if we can assume that about half of this fire actually had uh, net positive effects, given that it was lower severity or even unburned, can we consider that at $320 million uh, for suppression costs, we actually got about a half a million acres treated by wildfire for uh, the bonus, you know, low price of only $640 an acre um, and, and sort of partition out those positives versus some of the negatives. Uh, you know, again, the, the bear fire on the Plumas, this was for humans, a disastrous event. Um, we had over 2000 structures, 16 fatalities on this event, um, you know, and there's some major hydrological implications that will likely come into play for for Lake Oroville and the dam that was already damaged a few years ago and had to be reassessed. Um, but again, large portions of this fire, particularly in higher elevations and outside of the private lands, uh, had positive fire effects, right? 
And similarly with the SQF complex, um, there was a lot of positive in addition to the, the negative areas. So, you know, what I come away from this is, were the 2020 fires a disaster? That's the wrong question. The correct question for me is to focus on what are the elements of the 2020 season that were positive, that we can act on, learn from, and build on to really support and amplify forest resilience? Um, and what were the elements that were net negative so that we can focus on mitigating those specific impacts instead of trying to just suppress all fire? Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, there was a lot of net benefits, a lot of net, uh, a lot of negative components as well. And, um, you know, as everyone on this call is aware, we had some huge losses in terms of carbon. We had some huge losses in terms of legacy trees like the giant sequoia uh, that Christy pointed out. Um, and there's some key ecosystem service concerns. But really, you're just you out know, one minute, Crystal. I know you're wrapping up, but just to yep. give you time. Thank you. Uh, you know, but a lot of this forest was late succession because of a century of suppression, right? And there was not a lot of pre-fire, um, pre-fire there was not a lot of deciduous early succession forest. So we had over 2 million acres this year that was burned for the first time in a century. And what I ask is how can we leverage this going forward? Can we use prescribed fire now in places that have recently burned um, and use that to help facilitate forest health going forward? And can we, as Christy noted, really identify those areas that we want to protect, those refugia like giant sequoia groves that still live um, and figure out how to really focus efforts there. And I think this is important because we really need to change public perception. The public, the politicians, they still want to put out every fire. And if we, the scientists and the um, outreach folks can, can really describe forest impacts more comprehensively, uh, we can start to change that conversation. So with that, I will finish up. Thank you. Great, thanks, Crystal. So Amelia, I think we're up for another poll now. Mm -hmm. Yes, so see in the chat uh, another link uh, for a new poll about this last two talks on fires. Let me share the live results. Uh, uh, I think it should be open for voting. Um, this is a tricky question. I, I, I realize that uh, may, some people might have the same uh, different opinion, uh, different perspective of the same question. So, but I, I think it's an informative uh, nonetheless. So um, see how this, those distribution curves are moving about the, how much we agree or disagree with those three main points about the 2020 fire season. I'm gonna give it a few, uh, one minute. Uh, I'm gonna start counting. Uh, uh, feel free to, you know, jump in, <laughs> Crystal or Christy, if you wanna say anything here about the poll. Any, uh, we're gonna have a Q and A after that. Anyways. I've apparently failed in my job since there's a lot of folks that still think it was a fully on a catastrophe. <laughs> But at least uh, the number four, the complicated more information is going up, so which is good. More job for the research. Twenty more seconds. I'm not sure if everybody already voted, but um, there we go. Some catastrophe thing is going a little down. <laughs> Five more seconds and it's gonna be close. Okay. Uh, so let's do the, I'm gonna start sharing. Um, okay, so we have some questions coming in for Christy and Crystal and I'll go ahead and get started on those. The first set is for Christy and we had a couple people who asked the question in a little bit of a different way, but in general, the question was in the areas with post burning mortality, was there some kind of raking of the bowls of the monarch trees as part of the prescription of the prescribed fire? In other words, did you move fuels away from the bowls? Um, and yeah. then another part of this question that we got was, was there a buffer or size distance around the sequoia where the structure or fuel loading impacts survival during wildfire? So how, um, how much could treatments either 
reduction in fuels or breaking away from the bulls actually impact survival? That's a great question. And I think we don't yet know the answer. So for those trees that died from beetle attack, there was no, we do not typically rake around sequoias or remove heavy fuels from monarchs when we burn. Um, that is a treatment that we're experimenting with now in a burn that we'll be doing in July. Um, part of that is knowing more about what the mechanism is of fire damage that impacts beetle vulnerability. And we don't know that yet. So is it stem damage, cambium damage around the stem that interferes with water movement? Or is it root damage? And the, the mechanism would change what you would do. So if it's stem damage, then you would be raking and removing large logs. Whereas if it's root damage over a much larger area, you would need to be either getting rid of the, we have a ton of coarse woody debris, really big logs. So that we've talked about that and so did Emilio. Um, the large log load in these groves is insane. So um, we need to figure that out and we're testing some of those treatments now. And we're also looking at how sap flow and water source changes after prescribed fire. And then for groves themselves, I think most of the questions are about individual monarchs, so we don't know, um, but we're also looking at fuels treatments in the surrounding veg around groves themselves to prevent high severity fire in groves. Great, thanks. Um, the next was maybe more of a question slash comment for Crystal. There was some active, lively discussion about um, barriers for prescribed fire in the chat box. You mentioned, um, the perception of danger uh, because of high fuel loading as one of the barriers, but um, I know you've published a lot on this topic and clearly there are a lot of other barriers. Um, I guess the question really is overall, do you think having this burn landscape does reduce the barriers when there are so many barriers there? Yeah, and it, you know, as, as many of you know who are involved with these types of burns or, or try to play on these on landscapes, right? There, there's a lot of barriers, but what's interesting is um, how many of those end up being associated with the level of fuels because a common barrier, of course, is cost, right? And as we know, cost increases dramatically when you've got a higher risk level. Um, you know, smoke is another major barrier and obviously with more fuels burning, you're gonna have more smoke coming off of it. Um, so, so I, I think that what this sort of reduction in fuel loading and, and density across huge swaths of these fires does is it allows us to reevaluate those areas and say, oh, okay, is this an area that uh, now we've got a lower risk profile, we'll potentially have less, um, you know, public fear of this because we always have to come public issue, overcome the public fear issues. Um, you know, are we likely to have less smoke come off of this so that we're lowering smoke profile concerns? Um, and can we actually initiate prescribed fire here at a lower cost by having a fewer number of people uh, required to do the burn, have less prep work required ahead of the burn, because those are all the things that, that raise costs, right? Um, and, and it's, it, yeah, I mean, it, this is something that I, I don't think that we've done enough is sort of look back at these recent fires and say, oh, hey, there's all these areas that have now potentially opened up for prescribed burning, oftentimes because we historically have been really focused on sort of the, the highest risk areas, right? And, and unfortunately, some of the things like the GAO report, you know, 10 or 12 years ago or whatever it was, um, highlighted that. Why aren't you doing this in high risk areas around the WUI? Well, right, here's a lot of areas that ecologically need more fire and, and potentially we can do more of that here now. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question is for Christy. Uh, someone said, I'm surprised that not every monarch sequoia has been mapped range wide. Is there any effort currently to do this? That's a great question. And if Nate Stevenson was standing here, he would say, <laughs> yes, we need, he, he loves mapping sequoias. Um, they have not all been mapped and some of the mapping that did exist was not great. Um, so, there's a bunch of individual stems mapped in Mountain Home. Um, they're all mapped in Sequoia Kings. The Forest Service had, has grove boundaries. Um, so what we're working on right now is creating better grove boundaries um, using uh, 
imagery, satellite imagery interpretation and ground truthing that. Um, whether we'll ever get to every individual tree being mapped, that's a great question. And I think it would be a great community science project if we could get high enough resolution uh, cell phones <laughs> for GPS. Um, but they are not all mapped and there is not, the plan right now is about grove boundaries, not individual stem mapping. Well, that sounds like a fun project. And, you know, we have an extension in the California Naturalist Program and lots of people who like to take their INAT programs out into the woods. So I think that would be a great collaboration moving forward. Um, I think we'll go for a break. I think we're... Sounds we're, good. We only got a minute. We don't want, we're going to come